understanding, we are ready to begin. So, um, and I, I guess Mr. Drummer is not here yet, though I can't tell for sure. But let's see how we how we go about it. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being at the Public Safety Committee meeting uh, on um, July twenty uh, third, twenty uh, twenty. And we have four items on our agenda today, but really three of them are the same packet. They're all, the first three really involve the same topic. So, and then the, which is the uh, administration for the assistant uh, chiefs of police. Uh, there's an executive regulation, which is uh, executive regulation 320 for the assistant chief of police for the civilian, the uh, executive re regulation 420, which is the assistant chief of uh, police for the sworn officers. And then after that, we're, we're going to have a briefing from the Office of Legislative Oversight Report 9-2020, Local Policing Data and Best Practices, and we'll hear from Dr. Uh, uh, Bonner Topkins. Um, and with that, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Farag to lead us through the, the three packets, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Katz. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about today is the bill, which is to create a new civilian assistant chief of police. The department currently has four assistant chiefs. They are all sworn positions, and they oversee four different bureaus with different functions. This would add a fifth bureau, Community Services, Community Resources Bureau, I'm sorry. And in charge of that bureau would be a new civilian assistant chief of police. This would focus a lot on Community Engagement Division, the Policy and Planning Division, and the Public Information Office. It is part of uh, the Chief's new proposed reorganization of the department, which I'm sure he would be able to speak to if you have more questions and would like more detail on that. Um, this would help to enhance community engagement efforts and continue to build trust in the community, enhance department communications with the public, and it would help structure the department in a more effective manner to deliver the police services. Um, with this, accompanying this bill are two executive regulations, as you mentioned, 3-20 and 4-20. Um, the 3-20 creates, um, you know, the responsibilities and duties for the civilian assistant chief of police, and Executive Reg 420 modifies the existing regulation that deals with the assistant chief of police um, positions, which are sworn, and it adds... Um, requirements for at least seven years of progressively responsible leadership experience for both. It tries to provide parity among all of these positions to the extent it can, other than the fact the sworn positions are going to need um, within their work experience, they will have to have um, specifically sworn leadership um, in police work at the lieutenant and the captain levels or equivalent in some other jurisdiction. Um, one of my concerns with this was fiscal impact. They will allegedly abolish a captain position, a sworn captain position, and there and then create the civilian assistant chief position. They are in two different salary pay scales. The captain obviously is in the police pay scale. The new civilian assistant chief police position will be a grade X3 position on the executive leadership salary scale. So I was concerned about what type of fiscal impact this would have. Um, the midpoint salary for the captain position is approximately $130,000, which will be abolished. And the midpoint salary for the um, executive leadership salary scale is about $157,000. So the fiscal impact will not be as large as just creating a brand new position since they are abolishing another one within the department. Um, you know, it could give or take 20000 depending on the level of experience and the salary that's offered to the new civilian sworn AC, I mean civilian AC. Um, but I also wanted to note that a civilian position is going to have cheaper retirement benefits than a sworn position would, so there may be some savings there, although I've not yet been able to quantify that. At this point, I'm recommending approval of regulations as submitted by the executive, but the committee also needs to vote on recommendations or any amendments to the bill. Um, I'd spoken to Amanda Myhill about that, and she has no uh, comments on it and indicates that there are no legal issues with the bill itself. Okay. Um, I see Ms. Sturgis from the County Executive's Office is here. Before I turn to Chief Jones, Ms. Sturgis, did you have any anything to add, please? Yes. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, Council President and Council Members and everyone else on the conference this morning. Uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity to, to comment um, uh, here on behalf of the County Executive's Office in um, support 
uh, of the bill, uh, what uh, Ms. Farag has uh, provided in her preliminary comments is um, accurate. Uh, the only um, uh, additional uh, note that I will add to uh, this is that the uh, new position will also uh, support our um, reimagining um, public safety work, um, including uh, any um, uh, work that would uh, require any policing reforms, uh, also um, provide support to um, the, the newly created uh, Policing Advisory um, Commission, um, any recommendations that come out of that and implementation of those recommendations. Uh, this position would also uh, be monitoring that. Uh, this position would also serve as the um, department's liaison uh, for the um, uh, racial equity and um, social, just, uh, social justice um, requirement of the uh, law that was passed last year. Uh, so those are the only um, additional uh, comments that I want to add as far as responsibility that would um, be included in this civilian assistant chief position. And I um, stand ready to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Chief. Did you have anything to add? Good morning. So, so the only thing that I would just add, and uh, I think this would be uh, an added benefit to the department, uh, but as a result of this uh, civilian assistant chiefs as the, the abolishment of a captain's position, um, that position would be abolished in our public information office. Um, well, we would be looking to hire. Can you just uh, froze. Uh oh. I don't know. I'm on county server. Can you hear me? No, you can. You know, when you freeze on a hot day, I don't know. I don't know how that works. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another surprise me with uh, the, the, the <laughs> internet. So um, I would just say with the uh, with the abolish with the abolishment of the um, captain's position, that position will be abolished over the public information office, um, and we will be bringing in a. Uh, we are upgrading our uh, civilians' position in that in that uh, in that office uh, to have uh, to hire a civilian. Uh, to oversee who has expertise in public information field and uh, in, in media. So that's that would be the change uh, uh, in the reorganization from that perspective. But other than that, I can answer any other questions. Thank you. Um, and uh, Council Member Auburn Oz or Vice President Hucker, do you, do you have any uh, questions or thoughts on this topic? No? Go ahead, please. Defer to Council. I do have a comment, but I'll defer to Council Vice President Hucker. Okay. Yeah, he came forward a little faster than you did on this one. Yeah. Uh, that was probably too much coffee, Mr. Uh, President. But <laughs> I'm not sure I have uh, well enough developed thoughts on this. But um, I, I'm a little mixed on this recommendation. I think I think a year ago I would have, you know, just sort of automatically thought this was a, a, a good idea and a step in the direction that we want to go uh, following passage of the Community Policing Act and, and growing uh, interest on the, you know, a part of the chief and the county executive and the council for for quite a while on uh, improving our, our community policing. Um, and, and um, but this, the recommendation, as I understand it, predates um, the murder of George Floyd, predates all the community calls to downsize the police department, predates the um, uh, effort that we all are supporting to transfer some of our um, crisis response calls to HHS um, or EMTs um, uh, and predates um, the reimagining public safety um, work that is just now beginning with the consultation with national experts. Um, so I think some members of the, I think, I, Part, certainly part of me feels, and I'm sure some of the community feels like this, this is in a way um, premature since we're going to be getting a lot of recommendations from national experts about how to reimagine public safety. And um, they, those recommendations might include a move in this direction. They might include a move farther in this direction. And I'm sure there's members of the community that, that, that feel, as, as I think I do, um, why are we adding an assistant police chief? rather than just swapping a sworn assistant chief for a civilian chief that would assistant chief that would allow us to move more in this direction without it without adding more management staff i mean i've certainly talked to many members of the community for years 
Um, in some neighborhoods that say, I want to see more police on the street. We have too much crime here. We don't have fast enough response times. We're not visible enough. There's not enough community policing. I talk to other community members who um, think there's an over uh, policing response in certain places, but I really never talk to any community members that say we should uh, expand the size of police management um, and you know take that for what it's worth. So um, while I think the move in the direction of um, more community engagement and, and supervision of that makes sense, um, I'm wondering whether it would make more sense to retain the current number of assistant chiefs, but um, just move one from uh, sworn to civilian. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Member Albert uh, Well, I'd, I'd actually like to hear uh, Chief Manger's response to that, because I had Chief, some Chief Jones. Chief, sorry, Chief Jones' <laughs> uh, comments to that, sorry. I don't, didn't drink enough coffee this morning. Um, so Chief Jones, if, if you could um, just comment on that, that'd be helpful. And then I'll follow up. Okay, so um, one of the things that in management that's vitally important is understanding a span of control. Um, and, and a span of control and an understanding of operations and police operations and the way we're currently structured, um, it's vitally important when you have a bureau such as the Patrol Services Bureau, which is the largest bureau in our department. Um, and otherwise, in community engagement, um, that is where that that um, that bureau currently rests. Um, and um, one of the things we thought would be much more effective, um, looking at the county executive's goal for more evidence-based policing models and establishing policy and planning um, and directives and such as these things, such as the new use of force directive, it, it's really important for us to understand um, the dynamics that um, that are involved in that from an operational standpoint. A civilian, um, from a standpoint of management, uh, would, would cause a, a different type of restructure if we were to go to, uh, we would place one of our sworn assistant chiefs, and again, understanding um, uh, the operational impact of that. Um, and I, I believe that when we looked at um, what we thought was best in the Community Resource Bureau as the council has directed the department to have these community engagement models that would be very beneficial to our relationship with our community, then that is why we we felt that this was very strong in our regards of having to have a focus um, in regards to this particular bureau. And so I have grave concerns about span of control, um, about management, and that's important. And it's not really that we're really growing management. When we're eliminating one, um, we're eliminating technically one um, captain's position, we're not increasing the number of uh, sworn managers, or even uh, in this case, it's an unsworn position. We're only basically flattening out. And if you look at police departments across this uh, state as an example, we are probably one of the more funnel type departments um, in, the, in the state. Um, where there's this expansion out, a branching out, you might say, that gives a lot more authority and gives those uh, bureau chiefs the ability to really give more focus on the job and task at hand. Um, and so that is why it is, I think it's vitally important if we're going to add in a civilian assistant chief's position that we flatten that out. Um, and that's, and that's you know, that was, again, that's our thought process behind that. Thank you, Chief. Councilmember Albernoz. And um, before you do speak, I just wanted to welcome both Councilmember Rice and Councilmember Juando to be, who are not on the committee, but but uh, come visit fairly often. Anyhow, please, uh, Councilmember Albernoz. Um, thank you, Mr. President. And I appreciate that, Chief Jones. And I think Tom Huck, uh, Councilmember Hucker said it well, um, that a year ago when we were evaluating these positions, it certainly, I think, makes sense for us to move in a direction of adding civilian leadership to complement that of our law enforcement professionals, which is an acknowledgement that there does need to be a more holistic and community driven approach to setting the course and moving us forward as a community. So that that is a good thing, um, in my opinion. But I, I do I do wonder, you know, as we look at the overall evolution 
of law enforcement right now at this moment in time um, and whether there would be some value in, in looking and waiting until the evaluation is complete um, before moving in that direction entirely. So I guess, Chief Jones, if you could talk a little bit about, now this position, I think positions as well, no matter what, in, in, on a lot of different levels. Um, and so I, I'm not as concerned about the fiscal impact because you are abolishing a position in order to establish this one. So, and I think the difference in salary is, is real, but also somewhat negligible um, as compared to the overall department's budget. Um, the, but the, the bigger issue is, do you and how do you envision the reform efforts that are underway, the analysis that is going on, and how this position may fit into that picture? Um, so, so thank you, Councilman Albernoff. I, I really, you know, from a standpoint of before George Floyd and before uh, we started bringing in ideas such as reimagining public safety. Um, we already knew, for example, that the, that the council had established uh, the advisory commission. So we were prepared that, you know, regardless that we were going to have this position that was going to uh, be be uh, uh, an, an important piece uh, to that advisory commission, along with myself, as we look at the different policies. Um, that the commission might make recommendations for um, and to provide some additional input from this particular office. Now, again, this whole piece about where reimagining public safety, the Public Safety Advisory Commission, all of these different components now have taken this to an additional level that we're going to have to look at uh, down the road once we get this recommendation. I don't know what recommendations are going to come from these particular groups. And I think that gives us pause because it, it says to us, okay, how do we go about in our um, in the process of taking upon those recommendations and making the suggested changes if, you know, uh, based upon what's provided to us? Um, I can't really give an answer that I think that's going to have, um, you know, concrete satisfaction on anybody's part of exactly how this is going to play out. I think that, again, I think when we look at a focus of community engagement, which, again, I think is vitally important based upon what I've been hearing over the past year or so um, with our, 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 our community and with the council, um, that, you know, we need to try to figure out how do we really look at things differently, and this is why it's vitally important from this perspective. So, again, you know, for me, it's about if we're going to add this position, it's to really have a, a branch um, uh, of of my of the leadership of the department that gives a lot of attention to community engagement and uh, and the impact that it has, and as well as the policies, um, and uh, again looking at evidence based policing in these different communities that gives a lot of time and attention to that. Um, and if you have a bureau chief who's got other responsibilities, such as the budget. Um, you know, management and budget division, personnel division, that's going to take away a lot of, of, of time and energy uh, that needs to be given to this particular um, to this particular focus. And I think this could benefit the department in the long run, but it has to be branched out. It can't be pushed into another bureau um, that for that civilian, in my opinion, that's really going to that's really going to clog that and slow that piece down. So here's a thought. Um because as, as you were describing where you are, and, and I appreciate that very honest response, uh, you're right. Uh, there are a lot of unknowns right now. Um, but I think this position, just thinking more about it, could be key in helping with that transition by having somebody from the outside um, to help make sure that the recommendations are carried out internally within the management of law enforcement which I think would, would reinforce the argument for this position, particularly now. So maybe, Chief, and I, I wonder if there'd be some value in ensuring, if we do move forward with this position, that as part of the hiring process, there is a more intentional opportunity for 
potentially our new advisory commission, which we are about to move forward to have an opportunity to speak to some of the candidates before a hire is made, or to have some transparent community input process in the hiring of this position in particular, um, so that, you know, there, because this position will be so focused on community engagement uh, and be a bridge in many ways that will be very important to the strategy of uh, reimagining law enforcement moving forward, you know, it, it could be an opportunity, uh, but making sure that the right person is in that seat will obviously be key. Uh, and somebody who has trust, somebody who understands where we are coming from um, is, is, I think, an opportunity potentially if, if we do this right. So, so I, I'm curious as to hear my colleagues' uh, input and feedback into this, but I, 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 I think if, if, if the process is done in a fashion that's transparent, that has authentic community engagement, this position could actually be very helpful uh, as we move forward and evolve. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. And I, I guess I'm in a similar place to where you are. Um, you know, first off, police management is is uh, necessary for the uh, for police accountability. So I believe the chief has to be able to to be comfortable in, in how how we're managing the the uh, police department. Having said that, I also believe because of all of the the discussions and and rightfully so that we are having about. Um, uh, the, uh, the reconfiguration of a police department and, and how we can best move forward and, 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 the, and the best way possible. I, I think it, it makes sense to have um, police uh, accountability, the police, uh, sworn police uh, management, but it also uh, behoves us to have a civilian uh, a person involved directly as well. And, and all of the issues that we're talking about, the Policing Advisory Commission, the, the reconfiguration with the county executives uh, uh, is, is working on now, the his group, we in many ways are trying to put the cart in front of the horse. I believe that if we're going to be doing that, and we are doing it, that we need to have someone who will be working with those groups as they, as they uh, have their discussions and, and as soon as we could have someone on board to work with those groups, it, the better off we would be so, because they would know the history of how something got from A to B to Z. And so I, I'm not opposed to having a civilian uh, 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 chief, uh, assistant chief. I I'm, I'm also believe that we need to uh, look at the, the other for the how how our um, sworn uh, assistant chiefs uh, are are during that time of the policing advisory commission and 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 the uh, reconfiguration to see what what uh, information they come back with. But and part of my concern all along during this entire process is we have to be very careful that we don't say that we don't change something before we have something else in place to change it to. And, and I believe in some cases that could be what we're doing. In this one case, for the, for the, uh, for the uh, civilian uh, uh, assistant chief, I believe that that person will be necessary so that we can carry on our work in the most efficient uh, manner possible. So that's where I am. Um, any any other comments? Please, Councilmember Jamanda. Thank you. I think I sent you a text, but thank you, Fred. I, I was busy speaking, yeah. and I didn't look at my text. So yeah, no, no problem. Um, hey, good morning, everybody. And and I, I would agree. I think this uh, position is very important to move forward with now. Uh, the for some of the reasons you stated, uh, Mr. Katz, as far as having someone in place whose direct responsibility is to engage uh, around with the community and, and manage that division. Uh, obviously a big loss uh, in our community engagement division with uh, Captain Pruitt retiring. And, and there's a lot of transition um, 
in going on. And I, I know Captain Jordan will do a great job, but uh, I think this position is, is needed. Um, and also, I think uh, in regards to the Police Advisory Commission, one, one of the things I'm, I'm this has become a recurring theme that I'm concerned about is that we're putting too much on that commission. Uh, the having been on things like this before, they are going to get together, organize themselves, these 13 people, and then set an agenda that they want to accomplish. They will not be able to work on 20 things. They're going to have to work on one or two things, in my view. And, and from talking to some of the people that I nominated, I think that's the way they're approaching it. And that's the only way they're going to be effective because each issue is so deep and uh, has so much in it and will require data and follow-up. I think to be an effective commission, they're gonna to have to set goals, work plans, like any efficient agency would, and they're not gonna be meeting as much as we do, even if they do increase their meetings. So I think we, we, we we're kind of, even just in the last two weeks of saying, well, we gotta check in with the commission on this or check in with them on that. And I, I don't think they're going to have the ability, or is it the proper function for them to do that in that way? So I just, I just wanted to say that now because I, and I understand why, because it's such, we had such a great panel of people and it's a great group and we want to get their expertise. And that doesn't mean they won't comment individually or be involved. Um, but I, I just think they're going to be have to pick if they're going to be successful, they're going to need to pick one or two things a year and focus on those things and make recommendations around those things. I, you know, so we'll see how they decide to organize their work. I just but I just wanted to say that. So in this case, I think uh, moving forward is appropriate. Uh, and, so, and, and I think the chief stated it well as far as the, getting the organizational capacity together. For example, policy and planning, you know, having someone in that role ready to lead and respond to what we're doing right now on the council with the use of force policy. I think the chief mentioned this, uh, but also other uh, potential changes. That's a critical, critical role. The data that we're going to need, we're going to talk about data later uh, and, and what's not being reported. And, uh, and if, if I'm correct, chief, the uh, Research division would be under this assistant chief as well. I see you nodding. So I just think it, it, it's actually quite urgent to get this person in place. So um, I just wanted to make those comments. I appreciate it. And it's always good to join the Public Safety Committee. Thank you very much. Let me just uh, agree and disagree with you on parts. I believe that this new Policing Advisory Commission cannot just do two things a year. I believe that they're going to need to, be, uh, to meet as often as they possibly can, especially in the beginning. I believe that, that these are very important uh, issues, and I believe that, that they need to be giving us advice, just as the, as the uh, title of the, of the commission says, Policing Advisory Commission. I believe they're going to be needing to give us advice on many, many topics. And, and though I understand that, that they're not a, a body that has met yet, uh, every one of them uh, certainly came uh, every person that, that we interviewed certainly has an expertise in, 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 in a variety of ways, and I believe that we're going to need to, to hear from them. And I, if, though we're in agreement that the, that the uh, civilian should be appointed, I, I also believe that, that, uh, 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 that we need to make certain that they can do their work and that we should not make every decision about what they are doing until they have a chance to figure out what they need to do it. And with that, Council Member Rice was on the on the list. Well, thank you very much. And, um, you know, it's always uh, something when uh, Council Member Juwando and I agree um, when it comes to policing. Um, wow. <laughs> that actually says something. No, and it's not it's not an insult. It's not anything like that. I mean, it's just that, look, we, we have very differing views on things. And when we come together on something that says something about what it is that we're looking at in the overall vision for what our police uh, should look like. And so, look, I've, I've, I've been able to hear all of the comments that have been made to this point. Let me just say this. Um, and I think uh, it was Vice President Hucker that touched on this in talking about what we're looking at in terms of re-envisioning community policing in our in, in, in our county. And, and so keep in mind, it was Councilmember Navarro and I who introduced that bill. So let me tell you, uh, when it comes to what it is that we want to do and what we envision, it is this, it is um, reinventing our system to have a much more uh, forward facing focus uh, on community policing and civilian engagement and getting into communities. Uh, it also is a part, and I don't wanna jeopardize uh, uh, this disposition by saying this, but it was also back then 
talking about a re-envisioning and re-imagining of our school resource officers. There's never been, uh, as of probably the last time that education and culture and public safety met, and we were talking about the MOU, we then had a conversation about what you know uh, the school resource officer program should take on in terms of a new kind of iteration. We had already heard concerns then about some students who were uh, concerned about you know uh, having a police officer there and their uh, uh, undocumented status and the impact that that would have on them and their feelings. And so we we talked about a number of different nuances when it came to how it was we would restructure. So this is just co continuing that commitment that we already had. So yes, I agree with Councilmember Juanda. We need to move forward with this right away. I think that it's important for us to do this. Uh, I do think in some respects that we need to try and involve uh, our police advisory commission in some things, but in other things, you know, we need to move forward as well. We are still elected officials and we're not ceding uh, all of our authority when it comes to, you know, police matters to the Police Advisory Commission. I'm not saying that anybody's saying that. I'm just saying that for us, if we see something that we know is going to be better for our community, better for our goals in terms of what it is that we're trying to achieve, then we should definitely move forward with that. And I see that as one of these. And, oh, oh by the way, one of my major concerns uh, is, is being uh, sensitive to the fact that many people are asking about, well, are we increasing our police budget? Well, this, as we see with our fiscal statement, revenue neutral for the most part. I mean, maybe small little, you know, uh, sort of variation there, but nothing major in that sense. So we're not talking about increasing our police budget as well uh, in making this kind of a change. So that's where I am in terms of really saying that this speaks to everyone. I think this speaks to a continued focus on community policing, understanding we will still need to have police officers here in Montgomery County, um, but then also when it comes to making sure that they are more cognizant and focused on our community, on engaging civilians and making our police department an even better agency that protects and serves our community, this goes hand in hand with that. So I appreciate your deference uh, Mr. President, allowing me to talk, but just wanted to let you know, as a, like I said, again, as a person who was a co-author of our uh, uh, our um, community policing bill, this is right in line with that. And, and I thank you. And I believe candidly that this actually dovetails with what we're doing and working with the advisory groups. I, I, I agree. We, we're not giving up our authority. We need, we call them an advisory group they are an advisory group, but it dovetails to give them the, the information that, that we that they need as well as us. Councilmember Member Albernaz. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate the point about not piling too much on to the new advisory commission. I get that. But I think I mentioned in my comments that, you know, that some public body that could be the advisory commission or some other public body um, could be identified. And that could set a precedence moving forward as we hire some of these positions so that there's an authentic opportunity for community input into hiring practices. It should absolutely be done for this position because the whole intent is to work with the community. So um, I'm open to whatever that may look like, um, but but I think it would, would be helpful and, and establish a good precedent moving forward. Okay. Um, I see no other speakers on this, so Ms. Frog, what are you suggesting? Do we go through? Do we do every uh, all three at the same time? What are what? Are, how are you suggesting we do this? Uh, Mr. Dermer's here, and he can speak uh, more accurately on what you need to do for the bill itself. Um, I, as far as the regulations go, um, you can recommend approval or not, and they will go for action on Tuesday. Um, they have to be heard at this. Or actually, they might be Wednesday. I'm not sure about that. They have to be heard. Right and acted upon at the same time the bill is. So. Okay. Mr. Drummer, please. Thank you, Mr. Uh, good morning. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, before Mr. Drummer, could I make one, one brief comment, please? Okay, go ahead, uh, please. The, uh, to to Councilmember Albanizer's point, I don't know, maybe I came on a little, I know I came on a few minutes after. I do think, I agree a thousand percent that the community should be involved in this election. Once we take the action that Mr. Drummer is gonna run us through, 
in the selection of this person. And I, I would be curious to hear if the committee wants to hear, or otherwise you can follow up with me separately on uh, what Ms. Sturgis and Mr. Jones, Chief Jones are thinking about the process of including community input in the hiring of this person should this move forward. So however you want to handle that, Mr. You know. I think that you really are putting a cart in front of the horse. If we haven't even gotten to the point whether or not we're suggesting that we hire this person. So, um, Mr. Drummer, please. You know, it's a bill. You can make amendments to it uh, or you can recommend it as introduced. I will say one thing just so everybody understands, it's not an expedited bill. So it would take effect 90 days after it's signed into law. I don't know if that's a problem, but if you're trying to hire, if you believe you're going to hire somebody in less than 90 days, it could be a problem. If I, my guess is the way things go, it's probably not a problem, but just so everybody understands that it's not expedited, it will take effect 90 days after assuming the council enacts it 90 days after the executive signs it into law. Okay. Thank you. Council member, uh, vice president Harper. I would just ask, is there any downside? It sounds like everybody wants to move forward. So is there any, I, I, I wouldn't move forward and prefer to move forward in this posture, but it doesn't really matter. If everybody prefers to move forward, why wouldn't we make it an expedited bill so that the hiring could commence? Uh, understanding that we would have some kind of community involvement in the, in the hiring, not to grant the hiring, but to provide input. I, 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 I agree with you. I think if, if you know, 90 days, first of all, uh, that means we have uh, nothing getting done for these 90 days, and then we would, you know, start to advertise, I guess. I guess that's what that would have to be. I don't no. know if advertise in the middle of it. Yeah, you could advertise right away and start the process. The person just couldn't start until, uh, I mean, once it's enacted, you know it's going to happen. You could start the process. You just couldn't actually bring them on board before the uh, bill took effect. But the, the only, in answer to Mr. Harker's question, the only downside is it requires six votes instead of five. But you can amend it to be expedited and then you won't have that issue to worry about. I'm just pointing that out. I'm not saying one way or another whether you should do that. Right. Oh, I, I think that rule, I, I don't think we'd have trouble getting six votes, it sounds like. so. I don't see a downside person, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you. Councilmember Robert Ons. I'm fine with the expedited, but to, and, and I agree with not putting the cart before the horse, but I do think there is some value in hearing from Chief Jones and Ms. Sturgis that they confirm that uh, they don't have to define what it looks like right now, but that they would support a formal process by which the community has an opportunity to provide input into the hiring of this position. I just would love to, to hear Chief Jones and, and Ms. Sturgis respond to that. Chief Jones. So, I mean, this is a, uh, is the county executive's appointment um, is the way I understand it. So um, I, I don't see an issue with that at all, that, that the person could be uh, presented before a community, a group of, uh, of our uh, community members in order to uh, address their concerns and, and, and to speak before them. I, I don't see, uh, I don't know what uh, uh, Ms. Sturgis's uh, position would be, but I don't, I don't see that as an issue. Thank you, Ms. Sturgis. Yes, uh, yes, this is, this will be um, an appointment um, by the county executive. Uh, we will work uh, closely in collaboration with the uh, chief. Uh, the chief will have um, uh, control in the uh, selection process want to ensure that whomever we bring on board will be uh, the right fit, uh, not only for the community, but also a right fit for uh, the department. Um, uh, immediately, I uh, don't see any uh, concerns with having some sort of community engagement. Um, what will it look like? Um, frankly, you know, we um, had not discussed that. Um, so we will, of course, need to spend some time thinking about how do we um, involve the community into this process. Okay, well, just being open to it and, and moving that forward, I think, is, is a good sign. So, um, you know, it, it's not going to hold up my vote on this, but I do think this is a tremendous opportunity uh, for the executive to establish a precedence that would be helpful moving forward for other leadership positions within law enforcement. So I'll just make that plug. Um, but thank you for that response. And I wasn't expecting a definitive process, but just um, 
encouragement to, to do it. So thank you. Um, I yield back to you, Mr. Council President. Thank you. Mr. Ju uh, Council Member Juwando, did you have anything else to add on this? If not, I'm going to ask for a motion here. And I believe oh, no. it should be expedited as well. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I agree, and I appreciate Council Member Alvin. I was following up uh, in those answers seem fine. I think, you know, similar to the process when we hired the chief, there was, there's already a little bit of a version of a process. Maybe it wasn't perfect. You could probably tweak it as far as the community involvement. But uh, I think, and this would be an appointment that we approve anyway, right. correct? So, so I think that's, we'll be looking for that in the, <laughs> in the approval, you know, at least I will be the community engaged. So, no, I appreciate that. Thank you, Council Member Alvernaz and Council President. Thank you. Uh, who would like to, uh, on, the, on the committee, who would like to make a motion, please? Is there a motion? I should say it that way. Council Member Albernaz? Yes? Uh, yeah, I, I move the recommendation to expedite the development of this position to full council. Thank you. Council Vice President Hucker, will you second it? Okay. Thank you. All those in favor? It's been moved and seconded. All those in, to be an expedited uh, bill. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And that is a three to zero. Okay. And I, I know that Councilmember Hucker was was uh, voted in favor, but I think he was holding his nose as he did it on that. I, oh, I, I, I didn't know if you wanted me to. Uh, yeah. We were vote, we 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 voted on the amendment to expedite. I don't know if you need to vote separately on the final bill. Yeah. Oh yes, Councilmember Drum. Uh, Councilmember Mr. Drummer. Whether he, Councilmember Drummer, yeah, yeah, uh, I can't afford the pay cut. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to our world. Uh, they that real talk. Uh, real talk. Uh, uh, it's, that's right. He told it true. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, you, you just should vote on the bill. I mean, in, in, in committee, it's it can be just simply. I can say it's three zero for the bill as expedited. Uh, either way, doesn't matter. Okay. Or can to get up to a roll call vote. Thank you. Yeah. And Council Vice President, did you uh, have anything? I mean to be a stickler, but I, yeah, I, I would just say, I, I'm explaining my vote, um, I think I would prefer that um, it's, I mean, I, I would move this, but I don't think I'll have a second. So I would just prefer the department continue to look at uh, reorganizing the department. I would have preferred that we look at, you know, while I very much support the civilian uh, assistant chief for all the reasons everybody has stated and I believe in police community engagement very much done the right way um, that's very authentic and involves the community and helps to sort of rebrand uh, the, the view of our police in many areas of our community I think we would be better off looking at combining two of the uh, sworn AC positions um, but if everybody's not ready to do that you know I, I hope we'll continue to look um, at that in the future at, at, at reducing the management size, especially as we reimagine public safety and move some of our response calls away from the police into civilian response. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, so have, a now, Can I ask a question, please. Mr. President? Yeah. On that point, I agree with that statement. I, I, I'm not on the committee, so I wasn't going to try to make a motion, but I do think that would be preferable. Um, uh, I understand the, the concerns there. If that, if if we wanted to do that at full council, for example, I don't know if there's people who do, but I'm just from a process point, uh, Mr. Drummer. I guess it could be amended when we discuss it at full council to do that theoretically. Correct? Uh, absolutely. Anybody can make the amendment to do that, if, as long as you get five votes to to make the amendment. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, thank you. I don't know, Will, if you were on when I made some initial comments about that. Oh, okay. I think I missed it. I think I missed it. We can, we can follow up. Sounds good. Uh, Council Member Arbenaz, did you want to make a motion for the entire, for the bill itself? I'd like to move that we forward the bill as amended. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And that carries unanimously as well. Thank you very much. Um, the next item that we have... Mr. Um, Chair, yes, I also needed a vote on the regulations, whether or not the committee recommends approval on those. Okay. Is there a motion on Executive Regulation 3-20, which is the Assistant Chief of Police for the civilian? I move the regulation. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And that carries unanimously. And for Executive Regulation 4-20, Assistant Chief of Police sworn. Is there a motion on that as well? 
I move so moved. Second. It's been moved by Councilmember Abernas, seconded by Vice President Hucker. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And that carries unanimously as well. And that, thank you. Thank you. And then the next item that we're going to be doing is the brief, briefing on the um, uh, OLO report 9 2020, local policing data and best practices. And Dr. Bonner Tompkins, are you? Yes, you are here. How are you? Welcome. How are you? Well, good morning. I'm well, thank you. Good. With so, please, would you like to lead us through? No, I'm I'm following your your lead, Chief uh, Chair. <laughs> Sorry. Well, that's fine. I call people Council Member Chief, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, we're all good here. We're all friends here. So yes, please lead us through. Okie dokie. I'm going to um, hope I can share my screen. Okay. And it looks like it's disabled, so I'm going to ask um, Nick if he can add me as a co-host. Let me email Nick and see if he can add me. You're trying to pull up the report. Yeah, I was going to try to pull up the PowerPoint. Um, I can. Uh, no, that would, we should wait. Okay, he says she said he says I can share now, so let's see if that works. Yep, all right. Technology. All right. All right, so here we go. Um, so good morning. I'm Elaine Bonner Tompkins, and I'm joined by my colleague Natalia Carrizosa, and we're from the Office of Legislative Oversight. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to brief the public safety committee on OLO Report 2020-9, Local Policing Data and Best Practices. Um, before we begin, I'd like to uh, thank the Executive Branch and the Montgomery County Police Department um, for their invaluable assistance in helping us to complete this report, uh, despite the obvious challenges of working through a pandemic. Um, we appreciate their flexibility and responsiveness to our information request. So this slide provides an overview of the topics we will cover this morning. I will begin by describing our assignment and our project's five key findings. Uh, then Natalia will cover the last two bullets, uh, describing the disparities in police interactions with the public by race and ethnicity evident in, from a review of available data. And she will also um, describe our project um, recommendations for County Council and uh, Montgomery County Police Department action. So um, we were assigned uh, to the council council, the county council asked us to take a look at uh, the police department's uh, data sets and data practices so they could have a better understanding of what was available um, in their oversight roles. Uh, given the council's focus on uh, community policing, racial equity, and social justice, uh, this report highlights the police department's database that describes its interactions with the public which we're referring to as policing data. Uh, sources of information analyzed for this report include uh, literature reviews on policing data best practices, annual reports um, on policing data from the state as well as local sources, um, and interviews with um, police department leadership and staff. So our first project finding is that best practices um, recommends the collection and monitoring of policing data. While law enforcement agencies care about a number of priorities, what often gets prioritized for performance management is crime prevention. In response to the question of what metrics does the police department track, the most often cited answers 
among our various interviews were uh, crime statistics. Jessica Sanders of the RAND Corporation, however, warns that to focus exclusively on one goal at the expense of the others is to invite poor performance on alternate goals. She warns that in addition to statistics on property and violent crimes, police departments need performance metrics to incentivize and demonstrate constitutional policing that is bias-free and that placing all emphasis on crime levels creates a dangerous tension because it overlooks police officers' other roles and functions that should include these community relations. Researchers such as Saunders and others find that best practices for tracking policing data have emerged from lessons learned among jurisdictions that have been under consent decrees to address biased policing. These jurisdictions uh, commit to two um, policing data priorities as best practices. Uh, first, they collect and monitor data on police interactions with the public by race, ethnicity, and location to uncover and track disparities in police interactions with the public that may result from biased police. And second, they collect data across four sets of police interactions with the public. Uh, the first being detentions, that can include stop searches, citations, arrests, and so forth, and so forth on. Um, in particular, data are tracked for all stops and searches, uh, including those that do not result in law enforcement. Uh, the second uh, data set that they compile information around is on police and resident initiated contacts, um, including traffic accidents. And the purpose here is to understand whether disparities among these interactions um, may, uh, may help explain disparities and detentions, um, if evident by race, ethnicity, and location. Uh, the third area that they collect data on has to do with um, police complaints, uh, complaints against the police that describe civilian and internal complaints um, by reason, disposition, and consequence. And then the last um, area that they collect data on is surveys of police community relations um, and to track progress in building uh, transparency and trust with the community. And those surveys should be of both uh, residents as well as members of law enforcement. Our second project finding is that the police department tracks several policing data points. And this uh, summary of a chart included in your packet uh, describes um, some of those. Um, it describes in particular the data that's collected electronically by the police department. Um, we also flag on this chart uh, the availability of these data, excerpts of these data sets in either data Montgomery, um, and those are reflected by the deltas, as well as um, data that's reported in annual reports, and those are reflected by the asterisks. Um, we also note that um, given the passage of the community policing law, um, Bill 3319, that effective uh, February 1st, the police department will track additional policing data uh, that's included on this list here. Um, use of force and detention data by race, ethnicity, and gender, uh, civilian complaints against the police uh, regarding the use of force, discrimination, harassment, uh, data on officers suspended both with and without pay, as well as use referrals to intervention programs and service calls for substance abuse and mental health issues. Our third project finding is that um, there are several um, police department data sets that align with best practices. Um, we found that um, the following data sets at least partially align with policing data best, best practices. The first is detention data points. Um, that are collected by race and ethnicity for traffic stops, arrests, and use of force, among others. Also, um, uh, the availability of police public interaction data dis distinguishes between resident versus uh, police initiated calls um, that are tracked by the police department's computer um, aided dispatch system. And then also, um, uh, practice that aligns with best practices is that the internal affairs division keeps a database of police complaints. We also found, however, that there are some um, police department data sets that do not align with, um, completely align with best practices. 
And these include, um, for example, the police department not tracking a stop and frisk um, interactions with the public that do not result in um, an arrest, citation, or a summons. Um, the lack of an electronic database of criminal and civil citation data. Um, on some, uh, the inconsistent tracking of ethnicity data on some MCPD uh, data sets. Uh, the um, the uh, that internal affairs database not uh, uniformly collecting race and ethnicity data uh, for complainants. And then also the absence of the department uh, surveying uh, residents as well as staff on their perceptions of police community relations. Our fourth project finding is that the police department's internal data sets offer more information than its annual reports or data Montgomery excerpts. Um, the annual reports and, and data Montgomery uh, data sets for the police department only offer a subset of the information that they collect. And as the council exercises this oversight, it should continue to pose questions directly to the police department because their internal data sets provide a richer source of information than what's um, currently um, available publicly. And our final project finding is that available data um, suggested uh, why disparities by race and ethnicity um, in the police department's interactions with the public. Um, and so um, an example offered here is that although African Americans account for about 18% of the county's population, um, they accounted for about a third of uh, traffic stops in 2018, 44% uh, of uh, arrests in 2017, and um, more than half of use of force incidents in 2018. So to delve more into the analyses of what's available, uh, what available policing data describes, I'm gonna pass the baton on to Natalia to describe um, the disparities data in greater detail. And she'll also close this presentation by describing our uh, recommendations. Thank you, Elaine. Um, so as Elaine discussed, the purpose of the project was to describe MCPD's collection of data the project was not primarily about analysis of data, but in order to inform future data requests, we did use publicly available data from Data Montgomery to provide examples of the types of analysis that could be done. In particular, the Data Montgomery traffic violations data set, which includes race and ethnicity, um, as well as gender for drivers that were stopped for traffic violations, offers several avenues for analysis of police interactions with the public. In this and the following slides, I'm going to provide a few examples. Now, disparities by race and ethnicity that appear in these data do not prove that there is bias in policing. And when I say bias, I mean people being treated differently on the basis of their race, ethnicity, or gender. But they do indicate that further investigation is advisable. So this slide shows the number of traffic stops by race, ethnicity, and gender as a percentage of the population of each group in the county, and it shows wide disparities in the rates of traffic stops. And I should clarify that the population is the adult uh, population for each group. So for example, the number of stops of black women represented 18% of the population of black women in the county. The number of stops of black men represented 38% of the population of black men in the county. And then for comparison, the number of stops of white women in 2019 was 10% of the population of white women in the county. And the number of stops of white men was 17% of the population of white men. So two caveats to this are that an individual can be stopped more than once. So a rate of 17% does not necessarily mean that 17% of white men were stopped in one year. And then additionally, some drivers are residents of other jurisdictions. So on the next slide, um, we see that uh, it shows traffic stop data by geographical location using the county's uh, 13 election districts. The election districts are administrative districts defined by the Board of Elections. And the slide shows data for the six districts with the most traffic stops. Um, the uh, first uh, column of numbers there is the uh, stops per 100 population for each district. And it shows that District 7 
which encompasses Bethesda, Glen Echo, and Somerset, had the highest rate of traffic stops relative to its population with 14 traffic stops per 100 population in 2019. The rest of the table shows the difference between the percentage of traffic stops for each racial or ethnic group and the population percentage for that group. So for example, in District 13, which includes Silver Spring and Wheaton Glenmont, the um, percentage of traffic stops where the driver was identified as black was 15 percentage points higher than the population of black residents in that district. As the table shows, black drivers were stopped at disproportionate rates across geographical areas, but the disproportionality was higher in some areas. So particularly in District 7, which is the district that includes Bethesda, Glen Echo, and Somerset. Um, and you can see the difference when you compare it, for example, with District 5, um, which includes Burtonsville and White Oak. One caveat to these data is that they only include stops conducted by MCPD officers. They do not include traffic stops by other police departments, uh, such as Gaithersburg or Rockville. And like other, uh, like the previous slides, the data, like the previous slide, the data includes stops of drivers that are not residents of the district in which they were stopped. The next uh, slide shows traffic stops. Um, by the number of violations per stop, or it shows the percentages of, of traffic stops that had a certain number of violations. Um, it's common for police to cite drivers with one with more than one violation during a single stop. And the table shows that black and Latinx drivers were less likely than white drivers to receive just one violation during a stop, and more likely to receive four or more violations during a stop. And for example, 22% of Latinx drivers received six violations or more compared with 10% of white drivers. On uh, the next slide, we, we look at types of violations by race of, and ethnicity. This slide shows the top 10 violation types drivers were cited for in 2019. And it shows that the distribution of violations by race and ethnicity varied widely across uh, by the type of violation. So for example, the distribution of speeding violations, which is the most common type of violation, was relatively close to the population distribution of the county. Black drivers accounted for 24% of violations and 18% of the population. Latinx drivers accounted for 18% of violations and 19% of the population, and white drivers accounted for 42% of violations and 44% of the population. But for example, if you look at the distribution for the violation type that is about a failure to display registration card upon demand by a police officer, black drivers received 34% of violations and white drivers received 32% of violations in this category. So overall, uh, violations related to actions taken while driving, such as speeding or failing to stop when required, tended to stop tended to show less disproportionality, while violations related to things like registration documents, registration plates, and driver's licenses were more likely to reflect a disproportionate number of black and sometimes Latinx drivers. In the uh, last example that we have today um, is around searches conducted during traffic stops. And this table shows that Black and Latinx drivers were searched at higher rates than other groups, with 3.8% and 3.4% of stops respectively resulting in a search for these two groups, versus 2.6% of stops resulting in a search for all drivers. This slide also shows that the percentage of searches based, uh, sorry, this slide also shows um, the, it displays the percentage of um, the search is based on the reason for the search. So we see that the, the types of reasons here are probable cause, incident to arrest, it could have been a consensual search or a search uh, based on a canine. Um, the uh, probable cause refers to the legal standard where the officer has a sufficient reason based upon known facts to believe that a crime has been committed or that certain property is connected with a crime. Incident to arrest just means that the officer was arresting a person and therefore was permitted to conduct a search as a result of the arrest. The data show that the majority of searches of black drivers were based on probable cause. Um, in contrast, for Asian, Latinx, and white drivers, more searches were incident to arrest. 
So finally, I'm going to close by going over OLO's six recommendations for council action. The first recommendation is for the county council to define the term detention in the county's community policing law, Bill 3319, to include all stops, searches, citations, arrests, and use of force. The second recommendation is for MCPD to track and report data on street stops, i.e. stop and frisks, and field interviews. The third recommendation is for MCPD to regularly survey residents and staff on police community relations and contact. Our fourth recommendation is for MCPD to build capacity to use policing data to advance best practices in constitutional and community policing. The fifth recommendation is for MCPD to collect and report race and ethnicity data for every policing data set and then our sixth recommendation is to, uh, for MCPD to post additional policing data on data Montgomery that aligns with their internal data sets, including data on criminal and civil citations. I'm gonna, uh, that concludes our presentation. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back to the chair. Thank you very, very much, uh, both Dr. Uh, Bonner Tompkins as well uh, as you, uh, uh, Natalia. Thank you very, very much. Um, I, I, um, I, I have a few questions, and, I, and I'll turn to my colleagues. But for the the idea, or the the the, the when someone makes a traffic stop, um, do we know how many of those traffic stops went to court, and how many would have been found that those were legitimate traffic stops? So in the data set that we were looking at, I, I don't believe that uh, data point was in there. I'm not, um, and I don't believe it's in the database uh, where these are collected, but I would uh, uh, defer to MCPD on that. And, and, and then in the same vein, and I'll turn to the chief, but, but do we know how many of these traffic stops were, or traffic citations were because of radar? I believe that is that is collected, um, and that's something that we could um, look at as a follow up. Thank you, Chief. Did you have a comment on that? Yeah. So, so Mr. Katz, correct. Uh, you know, there are data sets that capture uh, laser uh, speeding uh, violations. Um, that is usually collected in the ETIC system that is controlled by the state. Um, the as it as it relates to your question about the adjudication of the actual charges um, that is a state system we don't have access to um, outside of a case search for individual cases which would be very cumbersome um, to actually capture um, individuals who whether they prepaid the fine um, whether they went to court and what was the result of them going to court um, we don't uh, we don't gather that information Thank you, and and um, and and now I, I, I'll turn to my colleagues before I continue. Uh, does any any of my colleagues I don't have anything to comment on this? Uh, Councilmember Robert Knox. Um, thank you, Mr. President, and I really want to thank OLO. I've been just blown away um, by the products that you guys have been delivering since being on the council and the level of depth that you showed here is further evidence that we're very all very fortunate to have such high quality work here in county government uh, and i know that you were limited uh, in my discussions with you and what you could track um, because a lot of this information is not gathered and the level of which we need and will need moving forward to fully be able to assess what's going on but even what has been gathered causes significant concern um, and I think the disparities, particularly as it relates right there on the screen on how certain policies are applied with regards to the look of registration and some of those other issues, um, jumps off the screen. I mean, it, it sort of speaks for itself. And I know there's um, obviously context here that's important, but I also think that it, it to me, provides a degree of evidence that there is an underlying bias, whether we want to admit it or not, uh, and that it's something we have to pay attention to and focus on and address holistically moving forward. Uh, there was a really great piece on NPR regarding the police department in Daytona Beach 
and they had a significant shift in their data that did show even more stark disparities than we have here in Montgomery County, significantly so. But over the course of a number of years, um, the data now better reflects and corresponds to the percentage of population. And they instituted a number of practices, both in training uh, and in policy and in procedure. And, and I think that obviously Daytona Beach is much smaller than Montgomery County. Um, but in the summer, when you include the population of people that come and visit, um, it's actually on par. So I think there are best practices that are out there, but we can't move forward until we know where we are. And this data really does help dictate that. I had a couple of questions and I agree with all the recommendations, um, but in, in my discussion with OLO, one of the questions I asked was, um, is there a way to track uh, individually um, you know, we, we, we're, we're tracking information by precinct, um, but is there a way to go even more granular than that without naming names? Um, but Chief Jones, are, are, first, I'd love to hear your reaction uh, to this analysis generally, um, but also um, in terms of the data collection moving forward, how will this be a tool that management uses to assess and evaluate how we're doing, uh, generally speaking, um, and is there an opportunity to look at by officer, uh, whether there are potentially biases there um, that track and represent a trend uh, that may relate to an underlying situation within an overall precinct. So if, if I could get your reaction generally, Chief, um, but then also how you envision using data moving forward to make sure that we are aware of some of these biases that, that seem to exist. So, so, so I would agree. I think that when you look at the uh, OLO's recommendations that uh, we, we in part agree with uh, many of them. Um, I, will, I will note that, um, um, that I think that's a very important piece that, uh, that needs to be brought out is that Montgomery County Police, we've been in the process of developing or attempting to, uh, to develop a new records management system. Um, and uh, we have been in, in that uh, process for the last couple of years. Um, currently, we're in the procurement process that will allow us to establish many of these types of data sets um, that are in place. Now, we don't own for example, all of the data sets that have been listed in OLO's report. Um, some, of the, uh, some of this reporting is owned by um, our Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Um, the OCR, the CRIM system, as an example, would have the rest data. Um, and uh, we don't control or have any, uh, um, you know, we have to gather our information from those data sets as an example. Um, but, what I, but what I will say um, that I think is vitally important um, in this county and in and, and, and our work as it relates to um, traffic stop data is a couple points. One, um, we have to understand that, you know, as we compare, and I think OLL did an excellent job in pointing this out, as we compare these statistics, we understand that even though it's not noted out, that uh, we have a lot of people that come through Montgomery County who work in Montgomery County, but who are not from Montgomery County. Um, and to travel through Montgomery County on our different roadways um, that are also, that, that could be stopped um, uh, by our officers for traffic violations. Um, and the other part that I will also add to that, um, as we look at some of the different data sets that I think were well put together, um, but for example, it this doesn't give an opportunity to show even leniency in certain cases that officers, for example, if I stop an individual for speeding, and I've done this, um, I've stopped an individual for speed and exceed the speed limit, for example, over 20 miles per hour. Um, and I go up to that person, whoever they are, um, and I have an interaction with that individual. And uh, the individual, for example, also doesn't uh, uh, display their registration card on demand. Um, I may decide as a police officer, given discretion, that instead of giving this individual a traffic citation for this speeding violation, which could be 
um, um, really kind of detrimental in a way of having more than two points on your license and an expansive fine, I will then choose to give the lesser citation of a failure to display your registration card, which carries no points on your on your license. So in, in retrospect, you got somewhat of a break. You didn't get a complete break, but you got a break that said that, you know, so we, we warned you about slowing down, but that we violate, but because you have multiple violations, as an example, we gave the lesser of the two that less than this. And that's, that's hard to capture um, when, when officers are making these types of discretion and toward moves. But I can tell you that happens often. That's been happening in police work for a very long time in certain situations. Um, as it relates to Ms. Alvarez, in response to your question about individual officers being able to pull that data, um, I know over the uh, uh, back in I don't know if many of you were familiar with it, but back in the uh, in the '90s, there was an agreement with, um, and it wasn't a consent decree, but there was an agreement with the Department of Justice, a voluntary agreement that the police department, the county. And the FOP went into an agreement as these accusations of racial profiling were done. Um, and one of the major concerns I know from the FOP standpoint was the fact that they did not want um, individual officers uh, pointed out in these. Uh, uh, they put them in groups, you might say. We put them in small groups um, and were able to analyze the data from the small groups that uh, officers were placed in. Um, in order to monitor and look at their their behavior um, um, on traffic stops, and and uh, when I say behavior, of course, of giving citations to um, to the different uh, racial and ethnic groups, um, and uh, and that's how that was analyzed. So, with that being, uh, you know, one of the things I think that's a um, um, something that we'll have to work with the union on. I think it is possible, um, but I think at the end of the day. Um, there's going to be, um, you know, some discussions that we're going to have to have with them um, as we are looking at identifying these particular officers, for example, who are pulling over people of, uh, of color more times than not. But I think it even goes into a deeper, um, um, you know, again, where is that officer working? What is the responsibility? Uh, what are the types of traffic stops? For example, what's the assignment? If you have a traffic officer that right that run that has to deal with. A lot of traffic issues, such as running laser um, on some of our major roadways. Um, again, the laser is pointing at the vehicle. It's not looking for an individual. Um, if the individuals exceed the speed limit, that officer is going to pull that vehicle over. Um, and, uh, you know, so we have to address that. We have to look at that, assess that uh, from that perspective. But I think there's another number of ways that we really need to have to delve into these numbers. This is why. This is exactly the reason why I had made the recommendation to the county executive, and he's also moved this forward with you all in order to do an audit, um, in order for us to be able to delve deeper into this, um, the analysis of, of traffic stop data um, that impacts our community and what that looks like. So um, from that perspective, I'll, I'll, I'll you know answer any other questions, but um, I just wanted to kind of make some points of, uh, clear there. I appreciate that, Chief. That's helpful. I do think that will have to be part of the ongoing discussion. Um, if you could just describe a little bit more for me the system that you mentioned you've been working two years towards building. Um, you know, data is, is so important, obviously, and you have to have the right tool and the right process in order to be able to, to capture it. Otherwise, it's garbage in, garbage out. Um, and so uh, what and, – and the consolidation – of the relevant information from the sister public safety agencies is clearly also something we need to be striving for to address the, the systemic issues within our criminal justice system. Um, and the fact that those data points are not currently talking to each other in a way that they clearly should be um, is something that needs to be a priority. So could you talk a little bit about the system that you referenced and um, what more or less that looks like and how it would be dispatched individually uh, in, in actual usage of officers. So, yeah, so, so our records management system is a, is a large, is a, the largest component of our data collection from a standpoint of report management as an, you know, crimes um, um, that we see that are, that occur within our community 
Um, and so there's a there's these different other um, systems that are also in place that, again, as I noted before, we don't technically own. So, for example, um, many of our officers in, in the patrol division and our traffic division utilize what we call the ETIC system, which is your traffic. Uh, that's when you, your traffic citation system, whether it's a warning or whether it's a traffic citation. Well, the ETIC system is owned by the state of Maryland. And so as we talked about, for example, uh, collecting data on, let's say, stop and frisk as recommended by OLO, right, that technically the state doesn't have that component in its operating system as it stands. So we would have to build out a, a component separate from the state um, or work with the state in order to try to figure out how we could actually do that. Now, we... We might be the only jurisdiction in the state of Maryland requesting that, making that request, and the state might say, no, we're not just building this out for Montgomery County, or they might agree with us, right, that this should be something that's a greater use for all police departments across the state of Maryland. And so that's a, that's a discussion we can have, and I think we could, you know, we'd have a good case for it, um, but the reality is that they own the ETIC system that we would have to implement into our data sets um, that go into a larger scale for racial, uh, I'm sorry, for, for the records management system. So a lot of the information that gets dumped, for example, into data Montgomery comes from our records management system, right? And there, again, that's our crime data um, that's reporting out on, um, you know, um, or, uh, sometimes, you know, with the, with the information as it relates to um, uh, uh, cases, um, it's our report. Our report writing system is is what we call e justice, and that stuff, that information is dumped into um, you know the diver system that's federally reported to the FBI that gives data about uh, that that uh, about what's going on. Our current RMS system is over 20 years old, um, and this is why we've been saying for some time that we've got to really update this records management system. We've really been. Um, um, focused on trying to develop um, new ways in order for us to be able to, to really track and report things such as stops and searches um, and provide this information that even as a part of our field interview reports as an example that would, uh, when you talk about stop and frisk, that could give more complete data on and analysis as to why individuals were stopped for specific reasons. Um, and so um, that is something that I think, again, is as we're trying to develop and we working with vendors now who can provide us with the specific data sets, data sets that, um, that we are focusing on, that we can have them build out for us as we make these demands and what, is, what, is, what, is, what does the community want to know more extensively, right? Um, and how can we embed that into one system that um, are, you know, at least for the majority of the information that we're gathering that will be protected and we'd be able to provide it and it could be dumped into to the other systems such as uh, data Montgomery that our community would have access to. Thank you, Chief. I yield back to you, Mr. President. I may have some more questions later, but I want to give my other colleagues an opportunity to comment and ask questions. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Juwanda. Thank you, Mr. President. And, and I want to really thank um, uh, OLO uh, and specifically uh, the two great uh, folks, Elaine and Natalie, Natalia, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I always do that, my apologies. Uh, Dr. Bonner Tompkins and Ms. Carazos, Carazosa uh, for doing this report. Uh, and uh, it, it's really well thought through and uh, very needed. And I had requested this uh, over a year ago and who knew it was gonna be as timely as it was, as it is right now. Um, and so a couple things, I, you know, I've said this for a while, you know, we value uh, and what we track and, and we can't, we can't uh, make the proper changes and make sure we're having equitable policing if we don't know the answers to some of these very critical questions. And I think we all agree with that. Um, and so one of the things I'll say at the, at the outset there is a proposal that came over from the county executive this week to dig into this data and do this analysis, something that, 
you know, since I've known Chief Jones, you know, we've been talking about, you know, going up before, you know, 18 months, two years ago, that if we can't answer why we have this disparate data, if we don't know, uh, we, you know, we're not doing our job, all of us collectively, you know, as, as policymakers, as, as the police department. Um, and so that's when that conversation has started about we need to dig in and get an audit of what's going on. And, and I appreciate the county executive and the chief and everyone's been on board with that. That's been a conversation for almost two years. I just want to be clear about that. And so the proposal, the scope of work that's come over to the council, uh, which I think we need to act on urgently, uh, is to, and we've already appropriated money, is to start that analysis, is to get where OLO couldn't go and deeper with this report about who was stopped, why were they stopped, where did it happen, all the things that we need to know uh, so that the police advisory commission, so that the county council, so that the county executive, so that the chief and the department can make can take steps to uh, change policy and practice. The new assistant chief we just uh, that was just moved out of the committee. And so I just wanted to start there because I think there's there's some discussion about and we'll have to decide in the next day or two whether we will consider and approve the organization sent over by the county executive to do that analysis that the chief just mentioned is critical and that we've been talking about for a couple of years so that we can get all this work moving. And it's certainly urgent now. And so I would just uh, start there. Uh, the question I have or questions, um, chief, you mentioned the new data system and, and I don't, if you could just be brief with the response, cause I don't want to take too much time. I know you're in procurement. What is the timeline? Are we, are we a month away? Are we six months away? You know, how, what do you think based on you, what you know? Uh, I don't, I don't, uh, as much as I want to be, uh, uh, optimistic, I've, I've, I don't feel like we're like a month away, but I think it, I'm hoping that we will be within, uh, within this year that we would have that finalized. Okay. Um, so Good. that's my hope. Right. All right. And I, and I know that's critical to some of the things we want to do. The other thing that stuck out here and which I had learned through the process of, following up on, you know, just trying to, as a council member, trying to request data on just who was arrested in 2018 by race and ethnicity. If you look at the report that's put out, uh, you know, the 2018 use of force report by the, you know, or uh, by the department, it's really, it's hard to tell. You can't really get that level of specificity just on who, and I got the information eventually from folks in records management or corrections or some of these various systems, but it took a while uh, to get the fact that, you know, we had these types, these level of arrests and disparities, for example, 50% of black residents, uh, black residents comprised 50% of the arrests in 2018, but it was really hard to get to that. Um, and, and Dr. T Bonner Tompkins uh, talked about what isn't reported. Um, and I think that is a, that's a really significant thing that we need to change urgently what's internal, what data we do have, while we want to fix the data and go deeper, what do we have and what's not being publicly reported? I think we need to, we need to address that to, you know, as soon as possible, because anything that we have internally should be publicly reported. Um, the other issue uh, around uh, trespass orders, um, and I think this was alluded to, uh, you know, that and Chief, you know we dealt with this when I was requesting the data. You were like, I found out that it was on paper copies at the individual districts, so someone had to compile them and put them in a spreadsheet. Um, and then those forms themselves, which was another point in this report, uh, didn't uh, always have race and didn't have race and ethnicity on them, and so we weren't tracking that. Um, and uh, so I think that we, we know that we have some some deficiencies here. Uh, that we need to address. One of the things I wanted to bring up uh, and have you respond to either the, maybe uh, maybe Dr. Bonner Tompkins could respond to this. The Could you specifically outline some of the areas like trespass where we d don't have uh, either electronic recording or we don't have the data being reported or collected or analyzed? Um, sure. So in your packet at the bottom of chart 6.1, we identify what are uh, paper records. And as you mentioned, um, so a civil and criminal citations and trespassing orders would be in that. 
Um, there are so so there are data sets. Um, so the question is, what is available electronically and what's not, or what is what what data are missing? So, well, I, from... I asked you two two questions. So sure. there's some things that we that are either on paper that aren't available electronically, and then there's some things that we're not tracking. So I guess I kind of asked two questions there. Sure. Okay. So some of the some of the sort of obvious things that aren't being tracked that we reference in the report is the idea of if there's a um, stop and frisk of a person that doesn't result in um, a citation, a summons, an arrest, that's not tracked. And, um, you know, that's really sort of a preliminary best practice of jurisdictions that are trying to make sure that they are advancing constitutional policing. Baltimore um, collects that as part of their uh, consent decree. Um, would, would, would that include, just to pause there and, and then maybe the chief mm -hmm. time, would, would that include if someone uh, is stopped and asked for an ID or run through the APHIS system, for example, which is the uh, fingerprinting, if they don't have their ID, are those, would that include those types of encounters or detainments? So, so perhaps, and honestly, I don't know, you know, the specifics of how it is done in Baltimore and other places beyond that they are tracking what they do. Um, and so that that's something that um, we could definitely research and find out what other places are doing or that the police department might have a perspective on. Yeah, Chief, I'm just saying, I know we're not stopping tracking stops and frisks, but when, when someone is, is detained and asked for their ID and or run through APHIS, is that tracked? So I am not, um, when we talk about someone, um, when we ask for their ID, um, um, you know, it depends on what, it's not necessarily that specific um, data set is being tracked. That could be combined with another um, stop um, or a result of, for example, if, 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 if that individual, if there's a warrant for that individual's arrest, then it could be captured in the arrest data, but it's not captured on a side note. And, and I don't know about APHIS, I'd have to look more deeply into how APHIS data is captured um, and how many times, for example, who do, how many times do we use it? Um, and, you know, what is the sort of the, the information that's, date that's captured in the APHIS, uh, in the actual uh, 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 analysis. So, you know, okay. we'd have to, I'd have to look into that to see where we are with that. Okay, I'm just, yeah, I think, I think that's, again, something else. And I didn't want to cut you off, Dr. Tompkins. I know you had, were you, if you were done. Um, no, no, no. Uh, I was. Um, I think the um, some of the uh, some of the sort of uh, gap between best practices and local practices that we identified, and I'll ask Natalia to speak to this a bit, is this inconsistent uh, tracking of ethnicity data um, or relying on um, officers to indicate race and ethnicity versus relying on ID if it's possible. Um, if it's available, um, because, you know, essentially, you know, you probably, when you, when you don't identify the ethnicity data, and in particular, if someone is of Hispanic origin, you're going to have the mixing of um, white non-Hispanic versus Latinx folks. And so that means that you're probably undercounting Latinx folks and overcounting non-Hispanic white people. Um, so it's, it's, okay. it's, it, it, you know, each data set has its own um, things that are being tracked and aren't, you know, sort of in the grand scheme of things, the, the traffic data is the strongest, uh, most comprehensive data source. Um, and then, um, you know, the paper stuff, we just don't know what's going on because it's, it's in paper. So it has it, it wasn't easy for us to analyze, you know, so just to be clear in this project, we really were trying to rely on um, the police department and a review of documents to understand what's being tracked. We did not go in and sort of, you know, examine each data set um, sure. just because we didn't have the capacity to do that. Um, we did, you know, request code books for available data sets and, and receive some of that. Um, but again, you know, sort of as you already noted, there was only so much we could do with what we had. And, and you know, I think that there's a lot more that needs to be uh, done and that reflects, you know, both our recommendation for the 
police department to organize itself to analyze this policing data in the same ways that it organizes itself to um, to analyze and act on crime data, on crime statistic data. Um, and then, you know, obviously, I think the, the, the audit um, and, the, and the efforts being proposed to delve into these, these are, these are great things that align with, with best practices elsewhere. Thank you. Um, and last thing I'll say is I just, you know, this is so critical because right now we're talking about just measuring disparate enforcement data, right? I have also talked about, and I know others have, have talk, started talking about as well, the need to measure positive outcomes. And there's no way we're going to and track that. And again, to my where I started, we, we value what we track. Um, and if, you know, and we need to make it be able to be done in an easy way for officers, right, who are doing their job. And so things like community events, I know that's something that has been talked about and is tracked in some, in kind, you know, I would say kind of inconsistently over the last several years, but positive interactions, de-escalated events, um, things that don't escalate to an arrest, we need to find ways, that's kind of the innovative, where policing needs to go, public safety needs to go, of how do we track positive interactions. And certainly we can't do it if we're not even sure what's going on with the enforcement level interactions. So so that's kind of a baseline. Um, the chief mentioned the speeding data set, and I just wanted to mention this because, and I. Uh, I know Robin Gaster had done an analysis of that speeding uh, issue, and Chief mentioned the discretion to give a ticket that's less than what the actual offense was. And I believe that the analysis that I saw was that that discretion was used as well, as you might imagine, disproportionately uh, to benefit white residents and not black and Latino residents, so i.e., the nine nine miles an hour is kind of the point where it's, it goes from a a more serious defense, uh, and m the people who were stopped for going x speed the same speed between white and black, for example, black residents weren't given that benefit of the doubt at in the same rate as white residents were, and there was a disparity there. And so somehow they were able to track that through some deep analysis, so that data must be there for that. But that's an example of another thing that we need to, to look at is how, how are officers using discretion to Councilmember Albernaz's point. I think tracking that individual level data, even if it's not known to the public, it's Officer X. I, I think that is something we need to look at as well. So thank you. I know I've taken a long time, Mr. President. Thank you. You have. Thank you very much, Councilmember Juwando. Uh, Council Vice President Hucker. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, Dr. Bonner Tompkins and Ms. Car Carasosa, I'm very grateful to you, uh, as I told you privately, for this terrific work. And um, I agree with everything uh, Councilmember Albernaz said about the work of OLO generally. Um, it's really, um, you know, one of our best resources in the county, and I really would encourage any of our residents who are watching to uh, to take a look at the report and, uh, and and pour over it. It's it's the kind of data that I really wish um, and and analysis that I really wish. Uh, uh, we, we had more of, and, and uh, we often uh, wanted to have more of at the, at the state level. I think other, other counties would really benefit from having this kind of quality work. Um, I fully agree with uh, the recommendations in here, and I hope we'll move those forward. Um, um, and I really appreciate the private briefing I had with you on the, um, the draft, and I know I asked a lot of questions then, and I don't want to prolong things now, um, so I might follow up with, with some other ones. Um, really grateful that the chief is here. Um, can, was it just, can you clarify one thing for me? I thought it was someone said earlier, maybe in the slides that race and ethnicity data, um, would be captured during future traffic stops under 3319. Was that, did I mishear that? Cause I don't see that in 3319. So my understanding from the bill is that it requires, um, go to, um, so the additional data points were, uh, that we cited were use of force and detention, civilian complaints, um, sus officer suspension is youth referrals and service calls. Um, yeah. Did I say that 
I'm sorry. I, I may have misunderstood or misread it. I just wanted to, because I, I don't think it's in there. And I know we discussed, I'm, I'm uh, as others have said, uh, concerned about um, the inaccuracy of the data of having off and, you know, putting it on an officer to identify someone's race. Um, you know, no one's going to be good at that. And that's going to introduce a lot of uh, inaccuracy in the data. And so, Chief, do you know the history of that? Why, um, given that um, an individual's identification um, is on their driver's license, why officers don't already just use that rather than making an assessment? So, uh, uh, on your driver's license, um, your ethnicity is not listed on, and Motor Vehicle Administration does not ask for your ethnicity. Okay. And we, and we is, uh, in, in my 34 years, I've never asked any person their ethnicity mm -hmm. um, on a traffic stop. Um, you, you gather, you take their driver's license, mm -hmm. and um, you, you don't ask for that. You look at that driver's license, and you make a judgment call. Um, you know, again, with a, with a very diverse community, it, that leaves it open for, very, for, for interpretation um, in many different ways. I mean, we could have an extensive discussion on that alone. Yeah, uh, right. And, you know, and that's just something we have not, we have not traditionally done. Um, in any regards, um, um, from that perspective, uh, to be respectful. Um, and when we actually actually take information via the ETIC system, all we do is scan the driver's license, and it, that information is dumped into the ETIC system through the Motor Vehicle Administration. So, so okay. that's the information in which we gather that. Um, okay. Thank you for, for clearing that up. Um, um, I know in, in my private briefing on this, um, I asked about this. And I'm not. Sh I either don't remember the answer, or we didn't have a, a conclusive answer. Some recommendations and requirements from the state about data collection um, under state law have sunsetted. Um, do you? Do we know which which data the MCPD once collected but no longer does? So. Um my understanding when I looked at the state data reports, it was on um, criminal citations. And so that's data that was being reported um, by the state under uh, state legislative uh, you know, decisions, um, but that that requirement sunsetted um, across the state. I believe it was 2018. Does that sound right, Natalia? Yes, that sounds right. Um, and then, uh, Chief, uh, we, we don't, in my understanding is we don't have the 2019 annual report from MCPD yet. Do you, can you give us an estimate of when we expect to have it? Yeah, it's, it's my hope to have that annual report, uh, released probably within the next, uh, month. Um, what's happened is I lost, uh, two of my, uh, planners in our policy and planning division, um, that were whose remain responsibilities were to uh, to provide us with that annual report. One went and left and work is working now for fire rescue, and the other has retired. So, uh, due to COVID, that's caused a lot of other delays um, as we try to try to prepare that. But we are uh, working on finalizing that within the next few weeks. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. That would be helpful. Um, I, I probably have other questions, but they're not very well formed. And so I'll just follow up with people individually. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you all again for this great report. Thank, thank you. And again, let me thank everyone for this great report too. We're going to hear from Councilmember Rice in just a few seconds. But I, I too wanted to uh, very publicly say thank you for the private briefing that that uh, that, that Dr. Bonner Tompkins uh, uh, and and, and uh, Natalia gave gave to me as well. I, I uh, uh, appreciated it. I, I uh, am very much in, in favor of, of working and, and, and all of the recommendations uh, to make certain that, that uh, we get ourselves to a better place. I, I also think it's very necessary to, to um, make certain that the committee itself uh, stay involved as best we can and, and uh, on all of these topics. Each one is probably something, or I don't know whether each one, but maybe we would 
look at, at once we get some additional information, whether we would look at a couple each time, a couple of the uh, recommendations each time to see how we're progressing. Uh, to to have a report, and everybody says, and it's true, the the uh, Office of Legislative Oversight is is an unbelievable group. But to have a report and and let it sit for any length of time is not healthy for anyone. So we need to make certain that that the committee and and the council itself stays uh, on it, and that we uh, make certain that that we're getting through. Uh, to uh, to come up to uh, with all the recommendations that are being suggested, and with that, Councilmember Rice, please. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you, Dr. Bonner Tompkins and Ms. Catazosa. Uh, I really want to say thank you for uh, spending some time with me and my staff, and certainly breaking down everything. I don't want to belabor and extend this meeting beyond the time that it needs to. So. I completely agree with every single one of the recommendations, the same thing that I told you uh, in our Zoom call. Uh, let me just say that this continues to build off of the community policing bill that Councilmember Navarro and I put forward in terms of trying to track some of that data. And I really want to thank Councilmember Juwando, uh for uh, uh, putting forth uh, the impetus for this Office of Legislative Oversight Report because it encapsulates all the data that we need to make our system an even better one that's representative of a police force that, again, protects and serves our community. Um, we see from the data that some departments are doing it better than others. That's something also that we need to pay attention to that I haven't seen or, or, or haven't heard anybody talk about. And so when I look at some of my districts, uh, some of my police districts, who the numbers are more closely aligned with what we see in terms of percentages of population, uh, then I start to say, okay, so are there some best practices that those particular uh neighborhood uh, districts are doing that we can implement across the county? Is there better training? Is there a better management philosophy? Um, what is different? And so that data helps us to analyze and understand those types of things to understand that some folks may be doing it closer to right. I'm not going to say it's right because the data still, as Councilmember Alberno said, the data is the data. And so it says that there's still a disparity that's there. But some of that, as the chief said, could be explained just based on what's happening in our communities, and that could reflect a larger issue of what, why some of those disparities happen, because, you know, we, we're not giving folks the right opportunities, we're not giving them the reinforcement and support they need, and so, therefore, these kinds of things happen. But in addition, let's not glaze over the fact that we know, we know that there are some officers who are on our force uh, who are not uh, going to... Uh, uh, reinforce the implicit bias training that they have and unfortunately are doing things the wrong way. That's the reason why we have the civilian complaints we do. That's the reason why we've unfortunately had some of the issues we've had here in Montgomery County. Uh, and so from that perspective, you know, this data will help us to hone in on those kinds of things and really make some concrete decisions. And so, again, I just want to close by saying thank you to OLO. This helps us to make our decisions so much easier when it comes to what it is that we need to do to help build, rebuild, uh, an even better uh, police force that, again, is about community policing and is about protecting and serving our community. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so just so I understand, um, are we, we're, this was just strictly a, a uh, getting an update on, on the discussion itself. This is not a motion today. Is that is that correct? Yes, everybody. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, everybody. yeah it's just, it's really I think it's just a release yeah. of the okay. report. Yeah. But, but I do think at some point it would be wise for us to, to um, formally uh, move that this, that this report be, although I don't know it's for the report itself, but for the, for the recommendations, we should go through the recommendations and move the recommendations as we go through. So I can um, just say, Mr. Yeah, Chairman, go ahead, please. I'm working, I'm, I, we had started, when I got my private briefing a, a while ago too, we started working on some, to try to put some of these in place and I'll, I'll share it with all of you. It can be a full council or whatever. I don't need, but we, we, we should do them. I think you know, we should just do them, but yeah. I'll, we're right. working on that. Yeah. yeah, we are too. Thanks. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you very, very much. Is there anything else to come before the committee today? Thank you to, to OLO and, and, uh, and all of your hard work and thank you to the committee and to the chief and Ms. Sturgis for being with us. We are adjourned. Thank you.